Thanks everyone for joining. I'm Mothka's Crop Specialist. I, I kind of try to approach all of these sessions um, just knowing that there's about as many ways to, to grow vegetables or grow other plants as there are people who grow them. Uh, so it's less about what's right or wrong um, in terms of like how you manage things because that has to do with your, your larger growing systems you're using and, and your larger approach. Um, some folks just like let the weeds go and they kind of love that. And some people are very, very clean, tidy gardens and, and neither is wrong. There's everything in between. Um, so that's just to kind of give you an idea of my approach that I'm more just giving you some, hopefully some tools and how to think about diseases as they affect your, your own garden. Um, mostly I focus on vegetable plants, but the same practices and principles um, should apply to pretty much any plants uh, that you're trying to grow. And I'll just get into it. So this is a slide that I borrowed from Eric Seidman. Um, and he kind of uses this as a general pest life cycle, disease life cycle. And it's good to think about, um, you know, over the winter, something is either overwintering here and surviving, or it has a resting stage. Like in these diseases, many of them are, are fungal. Some are bacterial, but most are fungal, and um, you know, so it has to it has to be somewhere. Where is it over the winter, and that really dictates how it's going to become an issue in the spring or not become an issue. And sometimes it's not overwintering here. Sometimes the disease can't overwinter as far north as we are, and it's coming up on storms uh, in the spring every year. And so you know, you have to kind of think of this winter section as where it's wintering, maybe down south. Um, and uh, then once things get infected or infested, if we're talking about pests, the, the organism in question starts to grow. It probably reproduces. And in cases of disease, they are often reproducing quickly and that's how they're spreading. Uh, and then in the winter, they're doing something to either overwinter here in Maine or they're maybe just dying off and, and they're gonna live somewhere else. And so it's important to know that, and that's kind of why uh, the biology of everything we're talking about matters a little bit. And it's starting to rain at my house, so I might close the windows if, this, if you're hearing a lot of the background noise. Hillary, you can let me know how it's sounding. Can't hear uh, it. Can't even hear it? Good. Okay, and so here's the other main thing that I'm gonna, use as sort of like a some framework to think about these things. And this is something in plant pathology called the disease triangle. And the idea being that in order for disease to occur, you need all three of these uh, primary factors. You need a susceptible host. So that would be your garden plant, whatever it is, say it's a tomato plant. Um, the pathogen has to be present. If there's no late white spores, there's no late white organism, you cannot get late white. It, it kind of sounds obvious, but at the same time, people, this is a, this helps us, uh, it's a tool in our, our disease prevention, knowing whether we even have to worry about it or not. And then our major way that we can influence things is that these pathogens need a conducive environment, a hospitable environment, the right conditions in order to infect the plants and not only infect them, but also reproduce and spread uh, readily because it's a big difference between there's a minor infection, yes, the disease is technically present, versus the disease is causing harm. Um, I think we probably have a lot of mild infections of diseases in our gardens that like don't even really become an issue. But of course, that, that's a good thing uh, in, in many ways because it's not an issue, um, but it's hard to know when is it gonna be one or the other. So this is gonna help guide us a little bit as we talk. Oh, and I should also say, uh, when you have either of the two factors, you know, you, have a, you know your host is susceptible, you know you have the right conditions for a disease to take off, then you are definitely at risk of disease should that pathogen um, show up. And uh, that carries through with all the rest. So we'll start off thinking about our host because this is sort of, We'll just look at each one individually, but of course there's a lot of overlap and there's a lot of interactions between all these, these things. But um, in terms of managing disease in our garden, 
the first thing that we have control over is whether or not we have a susceptible host. Um, so step one of pest disease, pest and disease management starts at the seed catalog. Um, what varieties you're growing. And so to look at, to make an example of cabbage, this is from the Johnny's catalog. Uh, if we zoom right in here, they have cabbage resistance codes. And that is telling you that some of their cabbage varieties have, if they have a BR next to them, are resistant to black rot, which is a bacterial disease, um, or downy mildew, or fusarium ye yellows, or white rust. Now, you know, part of this is to go back to that triangle, right? Like, is the, the pathogen. Sorry, was that a question? Oh, I think maybe it was just an accidental unmuting. Um, Thank you. Thanks, Ian. Yeah, so to go back to that triangle of whether a pathogen is even present, white rust is sort of not really an issue here in New England. It, it might be present, but I never see it on farms or get calls from gardeners about it. So you don't really have to worry about having a white rust uh, resistant cabbage variety, for example. Johnny sells to growers all over the country. Some places there may be an issue with white rust. Um, and uh, so if we look at this variety, Capture, it's F1, that means it's a hybrid variety. That's a whole other conversation. Should take 87 days to get to maturity. And then HR, meaning if we look back at their code, high resistance to FY, Fusarium yellows. And that's one where if you've never had Fusarium yellows, you probably don't have it and you probably don't have to worry too much about it. But if you have had it in the past, then you're going to want a variety like this because it is, has a high resistance to fusarium yellows. So even if it's present in your soil, fusarium is a, a soil disease, um, you, you already have a cabbage that's going to do OK. Um, and then IR, intermediate resistance to black rot. So if you've had black rot issues in the past, um, you know this is one that, or if you're a new grower and you just want to make sure you have good success, it, it doesn't hurt to have a variety that has more resistance. And then as you start to get the hang of gardening and growing, you can start to branch out into other varieties. You know, they may not be as disease resistant, but maybe you've got a good system in place and it's not as much of a problem. Um, whereas, you know, this other variety up above, you can see it's only resistant to fusarium yellows, not black rot, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, another way to think about these things is what, what crops are you good at growing? If the, every year, you know, some very experienced growers say like, I just don't grow fill in the blank because they just don't have the system down or it doesn't work with their personality to give it the type of care that it needs. You know, their schedule, maybe they're too busy and they only garden on the weekends and they can't be there to do something that needs to happen more regularly that some crop demands. That's another way to think about, are you growing a susceptible host? Basically, are you setting yourself up for success? What works well for your garden, your personality, the time you have? And if you're new, then of course that's part of the fun is discovering that. And it's just a good idea to try to keep in mind that uh, you may also discover what doesn't work well for you and, and try not to get too um, frustrated by that. And so that's some of our framework. We're gonna go back to that disease triangle. It's about to pop back up again. But the other thing, trying not to confuse my frameworks as I'm, I'm trying to set, as I put this presentation together, I was thinking, I'm sort of using this as our, our pathway, our map as to go through the presentation, but also I wanna include this. So anyway, we've got the disease triangle. We're working through that. And that at the same time, we're gonna talk about some key principles to organic disease management. Um, the first one is healthy crops. And that right there, resistant varieties. Um, some of the varieties are just known to be very vigorous growers. Look at your seed catalogs. Of course, they'll say glowing things about all of their varieties that they're trying to sell, but some they'll say really good for organic gardening or uh, thrives in tough conditions or something like that. And that's a hint that this is a variety that is very vigorous and is gonna be uh, a fighter. You know, it's gonna, it's gonna keep growing. It's gonna have a strong will to live. So. If you're new or if you've had issues in the past, those are usually the ones you want to go for. And then healthy crops, of course, also means all the other things we talk about with gardening that we're not talking about today, but proper fertility, um, getting a good seedling set up so that it, you have something very healthy and vigorous growing, having healthy soil, uh, um, 
uh, good good bacteria in your soil essentially is what that boils down to, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All these things, we want healthy crops because they are gonna be more resistant to disease. I do see this discussion come up a bit and people feel like because they have disease, that means they had unhealthy crops and they maybe had unhealthy soil. And you know, it's more true in the direction of unhealthy crops are more susceptible to disease than it is saying, trying to follow that back and say, I had disease, therefore I didn't apply enough fertility. That may be the case, that may not be. You know, sometimes a disease is present and there's really no stopping it because it's the environment is so perfect for it or X, Y, or Z. But all that being said, long way to say yes, the healthiest plants you can get going, try to try to get them started good and they will uh, be stronger to fend off disease and pests. So let me go back to our pathogen presence. And uh, that that is one of our other principles of organic growing is crop rotation. Um, and so you don't have to, please don't try to read this, but this is just to kind of break down flowering plants. Those are the ones we, we work with. Their big division is monocots. Those are grassy type plants, um, corn, onions, asparagus. That's a, a whole group of plants and they're not very closely related to dicots, which are sort of our broad leaved plants. And that's like everything else you grow, potatoes, tomatoes, peppers, squash, um, things that have big broad leaves typically. Uh, and then within those, so yeah, alliums, uh, they're going to be somewhat closely related, more closely related to asparagus than they are to tomatoes, brassicas, broccoli, coal, uh, coal crops, cabbage, beets. So they're somewhat closely related, but they're separate. Those are separate groups. Um, and so the reason we do crop rotation is that a disease that affects brassicas, if it's really specific to brassicas, is not likely to infect beets. Um, there are some generalist diseases that kind of get into everything, but there are others that are very specific to one family of plants or sometimes two families of plants. Um, so we kind of lump our, our crops into their, their families and that helps guide our rotations. So, you know, if you grew brassicas here in one plot one year and you had a disease like black rot, you can grow carrots there next year and not worry about the black rot because black rot doesn't get into carrots, at least not the same way. Um, and so that's one of our principles is good crop rotation. And it can be really important for, it depends on the disease, a soil borne disease, um, very important. Uh, something that's coming from the South, like I said, some diseases overwinter far away and they just blow in, your crop rotation doesn't really matter. Uh, because if it's just blowing in any way, does it matter if it blew into that garden plot or that garden plot? It's, it still finds the susceptible host. Good weed control, that ties in with crop rotation. Some of our weeds are in the same families as our crops, and so they can be an alternate host for a disease. Um, and also good weed control implies healthier crops, because if you have less good weed control, you may have a crop that is stressed for water, stressed for light, or stressed for uh, nutrition because the weeds are competing with it. Um, the other one is airflow, and we'll talk about airflow a lot later, uh, but if you have a big jungle of weeds around your, your vegetable crops, you do not have much air movement, and so all those plants are trapping moisture in the area. Uh, sanitation, old crop debris, crop residue, uh, last year's squash plants, if you leave them in place, they may, if they were infected with something, it may be overwintering on it. And then next year you plant squash, maybe in the, the garden bed right next to it, not even in the same bed, but it rains, that disease produces new spores and it's a lot easier to just jump that 10 feet than it would be uh, if you had composted the, the old squash plant or something like that. And that again, it varies crop by crop, how much, or sorry, disease by disease, uh, how much of a concern that is. So that's another plug for like, know the biology of your disease, or at least look into it basically. And that's not to say you need to know the biology of all diseases, just if you take it one by one, you have an issue with powdery mildew this year, okay, that's gonna be the disease I learned about this year. And 
next year I'll, I'll figure out what I'm learning about. Uh, Cause you don't have to become an expert. You just have to get to know what's become an issue in your garden and, and how to prevent it. Uh, and then barriers. This is usually considered more for pest control, but it can be important for disease control. And we've got one like really clear, brilliant example um, that is pretty common in a lot of our gardens. So if you recognize the pest on the left, those are striped cucumber beetles feeding on a cucumber and they cause damage on their own, right? That's an issue that they're, they're defoliating the plant. There's less leaf area. The bigger issue is that those cucumber beetles, most of them in New England harbor a bacteria in their gut. And as they're feeding, they infect the plant with that bacteria and that bacteria causes bacterial wilt, which is what the picture we see on the right is. And Bacteria are very hard to, bacterial diseases in general, are very hard to fight in plants. You can't just use antibiotics and that wouldn't be allowed in organic growing anyway. Um, it, it really, once the plant's infected, especially with something systemic like this, like bacterial wilt, there's not much you can do other than rip up the plant. So our main control strategy is to not let the cucumber beetles infect the plant. And some, some plants, uh, and I should say, speaking of crop rotation, this is only an issue with cucurbits. And as the name implies, striped cucumber beetle really likes the cucurbit family, cucumber, squash, melons. Um, and so if you can protect your cucumber, squash, and melons from the cucumber beetle, at least when they're small, that is when they are most susceptible to this bacterial disease. If there's enough pressure, they can get it later in life, but uh, as they're a larger mature plant, especially when they're fruiting, that tends to stress the plant and it, it can't fight things off as well. Um, but here's a picture I just took from my own garden that is called uh, ProtectNet, or there's other, ExcludeNet is another brand. It's a little pricey, uh, but it should last a long time. Row cover, floating row cover, that we often recommend for keeping disease insects out is the same thing. So those are my big uh, winter squash. I probably started too early, but it worked out this year. We were warm. Um, and I have no cucumber beetles on them and no squash bugs. And so they are not getting ill. You also notice they are not blooming yet. And that's why it's not an issue at all that they're under row cover. So I don't have to worry about these getting bacterial wilt. I have essentially excluded the pathogen. Later, when they are starting to bloom and I need the flowers to pollinate, I will take row covers off probably, at least temporarily for me to hand pollinate. Maybe I'll try that. Maybe I'll just open it up and let the bees do the work for me. Uh, but that's when cucumber beetles may show up and they may transmit this disease. These plants are already pretty large. They're pushing at the cover. They're, they're uh, ready to fight their way out. It's gonna, they're gonna be much uh, more resistant to bacterial wilt. They're not gonna suffer as much if they are infected. And then know what you have. Again, I'm just, I'm, I'm pushing the biology, but not just the biology. And here we'll do like a little, uh, uh, things that are commonly thought of as diseases and whether you have to think about it as a disease or think about it as something else. Some of these are diseased caused by pathogens and some of these aren't, and it trips up a lot of people. This is one I get questions about every year. Um, if anybody's had this in their tomatoes, it's called blossom end rot. Here, there, here's some green tomatoes that have been tossed out. This is what it can look like on a ripe fruit. It really gets kind of nasty. Uh, and it can also show up on peppers, although it tends to show up on the sidewall. Um, and that can also be sun scald damage. So either way, sun scald, uh, but what we're seeing in the tomatoes is definitely blossom end rot. Those are abiotic, that, meaning there is no pathogen present. On this one, it's dead tissue. And so now there are pathogens coming in to, to break down that dead tissue. They're sort of decay organisms, but they're not pathogenic organisms. They're not uh, disease causing on their own. What's happening is that the plant is growing rapidly and it's either the soil is too dry for it to get as much calcium out of the soil as it needs, or the soil is too wet. And that's actually causing the roots to perform poorly. They're not getting as much oxygen as they need to, to thrive and get that calcium. Uh, so blossom end rot tends to happen in younger tomato plants, that first fruiting of the season. And um, they, uh, it will, 
really it looks like a disease. We call it rot uh, because the plant does, that, that blossom end does start to rot, but it's a calcium deficiency. It doesn't mean you don't have the calcium in the soil. It means the plant can't access it. And so that's one where we just need uh, more regular watering. This next one looks nasty. Here's a potato, it looks very concerning. Here's a bean plant. And you see the dying back from the edges. That is called hopper burn and it is not a disease. Um, it is actually caused by this little potato leaf hopper and they fly up from the south and you can read the pest report article about it. Uh, I don't want to take up too much time right now, but they fly up from the south every year and they cause that damage. And so that's another one where people, it looks like a disease, but it's actually uh, this, this leaf hopper injects a toxin while it's feeding and that's what causes that damage to the plant. Here's one, just somebody with their seed garlic, they were curing it in a greenhouse and they had it on the floor. The floor was black uh, landscape fabric, it got really, really hot. Looks like a disease, it's really just, uh, it, got, it got sort of scorched and waxy. And so that's gonna be a, a seed garlic clove that's not gonna do well. Uh, here's one that I got, this looks like Botrytis leaf blight, which is a disease that can get into garlic and onions but it's pretty rare, uh, relatively rare for home gardens. Um, and when I went there, I looked and I saw the same symptoms on a beet. Now, if we think about our crop rotation, our different plant families, beets and onions are very much not related. Uh, Botrytis leaf blight on onions would not go to beets. And what I found was that actually all of one side of the plant had this and the other side of the plant didn't. And I realized it was from a driving rain or maybe some light hail that had hit from a storm and it had bruised all the leaves on one side, the direction the wind was going. And that was, it was across many different plant species. So if you see it, it's like affecting everything in the garden all at once, it's either a crazy, very generalist disease, which we don't see very often, or it's likely to be something else, something abiotic. Okay. Now we'll get back to where we can really do the control. You can see I gave it double arrows. This is, this is really what, where most of our strategies uh, lay is in trying to modify that conducive environment to disease development. And so we're trying to make it less conducive to disease development. Uh, here's a good example disease, one that is pretty much always present and most many of our garden plants are fairly susceptible. So you can see here it is causing gray mold in peas, a gray mold on strawberries, uh, a gray mold that's infecting the flowers of a tomato and that is causing those flowers to drop off before they form the tomato. And the disease is called botrytis and it's ubiquitous. You can't rotate away from botrytis. It's in your garden, it's in the woods, it's in your neighbor's lawn. Uh, and here's a picture of its spores, not that you'll probably get a chance to see unless you've got a microscope and that would be cool, lucky you. Uh, but what we do know about botrytis is that the germination of those spores and resulting infection of whatever host it's landed on is dependent on a film of moisture for eight to 12 hours or relative humidity of 93% or greater and temperatures between 55 and 75 degrees. So that's one where in the home garden, you know, there's only so much you can do to modify this, but this shows that uh, controlling humidity and, and like relative humidity in the air around me right now is one thing, but in the air surrounding a plant, those leaves trap moisture and humidity. That's something else. That's why we talk about airflow a lot. Um, it's why you wouldn't want to water your garden for over eight hours because that constant film of moisture will allow the disease to develop. Uh, and we'll show you some pictures of how these diseases actually get into our plants and, and it'll make a little more sense, I think. So here's how diseases uh, can penetrate leaves, um, whether they're fungal or bacterial diseases. If you have a wound in your leaf, see these little, these are our, our plant cells. Uh, you've got a, a tear in there. The fungal spore germinates and mycelia kind of go in through there. Here's uh, bacteria reproducing in water and they're spreading and they go into that wound through there. Uh, stomata 
and we'll show you a picture of those. Those are little holes in leaves, typically on the bottom of the leaf, that the, the leaves uh, exchange air through. So when it's, it's, they can't breathe, they don't have muscles, but there's air going in and out of those leaves. Um, moisture goes out and it, it, they're very important to the plant. That's how carbon dioxide goes in and oxygen comes out with photosynthesis. Uh, but they are also an opening. So it's, it does have some control. It opens and shuts during the day and the night for the plant to be able to do its normal growing. And here you can see, well, these little things are, are bacteria just living on the plant surface. This is a fungal spore that has germinated and the hyphae went right in there. If, and here's an, an, an up close shot. If there's no moisture, that spore can't germinate and grow that far. Um, and that's the, the trick. Uh, hydathodes are just another opening in a plant. They actually are how plants uh, remove excess moisture. So up on the top of this leaf, we see morning dew. On the edge, we see these big droplets. That's actually water that came from inside the plant and got pushed out. And because overnight, they're not photosynthesizing, they're not using water, they get too much water pressure buildup and they have to get rid of it, otherwise they would burst their cells. Uh, but if you then were working the garden and you happen to walk past a diseased plant, maybe you were pulling some diseased leaves off of it, and you walked past this, when you, if you got bacteria on those droplets, it can get sucked back inside the plant. You know, when the sun starts hitting, the plant will start using water for photosynthesis and it will suck some of that moisture back in and a disease that's present can go back in with it. And that's actually how black rot of of brassicas uh, often gets transferred is through these. And so you usually see the symptoms on the edge of the plant. It's kind of a diagnostic feature. And then lastly, and this is what we're really worried about usually for a lot of our diseases, it's called direct penetration. And only fungi can do this. Bacteria can't really do this. They can't get through the, the leaf surface. But if a fungal spore is released into the atmosphere, it's blowing around, and it finally falls down and it lands on your plant leaves on the top. There's usually not a wound there. There's usually not open stomates. Those are usually on the bottom. It's, it's rare for uh, a, a fungal spore to land right next to it. Um, and, you know, ideally, the, most fungi don't get through the hydrothodes. That's a, a rare issue. This is where a lot of our common garden diseases are coming through. And they are sitting on that leaf surface and it's just, they have the right environment that they're able to grow. The spore germinates, it starts to grow out and it can, it starts to make compounds that dissolve the leaf surface. And that's how it gets through and into the, once it gets past that leaf surface, then it can start to grow on the leaf and, and take the leaf's nutrients and thrive that way. So that's really the environment we're trying to control is that leaf surface right there. Uh, when we talk about controlling the environment. And here's just another example of it. Um, this, the, the penetration peg, this, all this, this is where digestive enzymes are breaking down that plant and they are going in. And once it gets into that plant cell, suck all the plant's sugars out of it and things like that. So that's why we need to facilitate rapid drying. That's our next bullet point. Um, and if you're a MOFCA member, uh, you may have already seen in the summer edition of our paper, I wrote a little article about making your garden less hospitable to disease. And really what I'm talking about there is a lot of the same stuff. Um, and you can find that on our website, uh, mofka.org. Uh, but how, why airflow is so important in facilitating rapid drying is really the key thing. And as an example, I, I did this in my own garden too the other day. Uh, to take some pictures, because I, I mentioned pruning tomatoes. This is one of our classic examples. Many of our tomato diseases, they need that, that moisture, they need that kind of wet surface. So the more airflow you have around the plants and through the plants, the, the harder it is for a disease to take hold. Um, so the first thing is you can see it's tied up here. It's trellised. It's got a, a basket weave around it. There's a couple stakes and then these strings are, are being wrapped around it and that's helping hold it up because if it's on the ground it's going to stay wetter. Um, some of these diseases are also splashing up from the soil as uh, that's their initial entryway. Um, and then tomatoes are really kind of weedy. 
they get really bushy. If you've grown tomatoes before, you've probably seen they want to get really, oh, rats. My PowerPoint just shut down. I, <laughs> I will open it back up again. Uh, hopefully this won't be an issue. But uh, I, this has been happening with my computer because it struggles a little bit to, to um, handle larger presentations and Zoom at the same time. Should be opening. Yep. Okay, so you're getting a little sneak peek of what you're about to see. All right, so they get really shrubby. They get many different leaders that come about. Uh, and that's what I'm talking about is this. It's called a sucker. And you see there's your normal tomato leaf. And right in the, the, the leaf crotch, the axle of the leaf, is where a new stem is emerging. And instead of just being another leaf that's growing there, it is a new stem with its own leaves and it will produce its own flowers and fruit. And you might be tempted to keep it um, in some varieties that make sense, like cherry tomatoes, just let them go crazy. They grow vigorously, they become a jungle and you just pick whatever tomatoes you can get off of them. But when you, have, you want big slicing tomatoes, you want the plant to devote its energy to, to just a few fruit clusters um, you don't want it crowded and you want really good airflow for disease resistance. Uh, so here are the other suckers that I would be removing. And then here, here's the same plant after I've removed those suckers. And you can see that you can see more of the ground underneath it. You can see why air is going to flow through there a little bit better. Um, here's another shot of another tomato. Um, I like to have two main leaders. Uh, lots of, like I said, there's lots and lots of different ways for people to grow tomatoes. So here's the primary stem, um, and there's the first fruit cluster. So that's going to be my first set of fruits on that, that tomato plant. And then this is the first sucker below that first fruit cluster. That's the one I like to let become its own stem. And so now I have one plant, but two stems. So it's like two plants in one set of roots. Um, and that tends to be the sucker that is most vigorous. The plant naturally wants to let that one go for some reason. Uh, whereas you can see these other ones down below are smaller and given time they'll take off and it'll become just a shrub instead of a, an upright tomato plant. Uh, here it is after pruning. So you can see looking at that bottom again, it, there's just going to be better air movement down there. Um, and what you do after the first fruit cluster depends a little bit on your type of tomatoes and that's uh, for further discussion, I don't want to spend too much time, but uh, yeah, again, here's that same fruit cluster in the same secondary leader. Um, actually, I can maybe take a moment here. Are there any questions so far? How's everyone feeling? Okay, I think I'm not hearing, seeing anything. Okay. We'll just keep going then. Good. Uh, so we are facilitating rapid drying. And then I, I won't be mentioning pests today because this one, this talks primarily about uh, diseases. I do think we have, we may have some previous pest talks that are in the, uh, somewhere on our YouTube channel. I don't know, Hillary, maybe you can dig up one of those. and with uh, uh, I also will we'll plug our, the pest report which tells you about diseases and pests that are more relevant to the time of year uh, and we'll, we'll send you a link to that in the chat and so I see a question about do you leave the leaf when you sucker prune and yes because those leaves are feeding your plant so down here this is the leaf that is left behind and the sucker has been removed Okay, so biological control. There's a couple ways that this works. Um, and uh, one of those is that you may actually have direct competition on the leaf surface. You may have good bacteria that are living on that leaf. And so a fungal spore lands and the good bacteria just eat it. 
or you may have good bacteria and good fungi in the soil. Hopefully you do. Hope you have a good healthy soil, maybe some good compost you've added. And the plant, there's a couple things that can happen there. The, the good fungal growth can invade the roots and actually help the roots get nutrients, but they are also protecting the roots from bad diseases, bad fungus, bad bacteria. Um, the other thing is just the presence of microbes around them spur plants on to create better defenses, even if those microbes aren't attacking them. Just the, it's sort of like there's a few signals that the plant gets and goes, oh, there's microbes, I better make thicker cell walls and things like that, um, that are, are more resistant. Um, and biological control also goes back to this first bullet of healthy crops. I like to recommend to commercial growers of one product uh, called Root Shield. And it's not that it has to be this product, it's just the name that I remember the best. There's other ones like it, um, and it's a, a beneficial fungus. They add to their potting mix, and that infects the roots in a good way. It's protecting them from damping off diseases, and that gives you a healthier plant going into the field, but it also is a biological control because that fungus will actually eat some of the, the disease-causing ones. Um, biological control, we usually use those, that name more for pest control, and that's like uh, beneficial parasitoid wasps and things like that that eat other pests in your garden, which we're not talking about today. Uh, botanicals, um, like neem oil, and uh, that's one that it can have some disease uh, suppression. Not suppression, I should say uh, prevention. Most of our disease control, we, are, we can't do much after it's already infected a plant. What we're trying to do is intercept that spore before it actively in infects. And we're trying to change the environment on the leaf surface. And so neem uh, gets applied to a leaf surface and it would, it would change that environment a bit. It may also spur the plant on to, for some of its own di di uh, disease resistance. And then we start to get into synthetic chemicals, and um, that would include copper, uh, which some people don't like to use in the garden. I don't think it's too bad of an issue if you're using small amounts and you're following the instructions carefully, uh, you're, you're following everything. So many fungicide products if, that are organic approved have copper in it, um, some have sulfur, and then there are some uh, oils, like horticultural oil that sometimes get used. Uh, for some diseases. It depends a little bit on the disease, whether it's worth using one or another. Um, but again, like copper and sulfur, they are changing that environment right on the leaf surface at sort of a microscopic level. So the, the, the spore lands, it starts to germinate, encounters copper, and it dies, and it can't infect the plant. And that's how it's, it's preventative. So when you see the disease already there, it might make sense to spray a fungicide because you'll protect healthy growth that hasn't been infected, but you're never, that infected leaf is, will never not be infected. It is now infected and you could either remove it or you can let the plant slowly die or, or not, not the, let the plant kill off that one leaf. That's kind of a, a plant's main immune system response because they don't have a true immune system. They really try to wall off an infected area and make really strong cell walls around it and then um, let that die. And, and therefore the, the disease is stuck and hopefully can't spread throughout the plant. Uh, I should also probably pause here to uh, talk about in the pest report, I tried to give some distinction between what can be used in a garden and what can be used in a commercial setting. Um, and anything that can be used in a commercial setting, you could use in your own garden if you, were a licensed pesticide applicator, and that's something you would do through the Board of Pesticide Control. And it's really more than most people wanna do for their home gardens. Um, but a commercial grower has to be a licensed pesticide applicator, and they um, can only use certain products that are registered for commercial use. And it's sort of like protecting uh, the consumer. And so there's guidelines from the EPA and guidelines from Board of Pesticide Control that have to be followed, and they have to follow the label instructions. Home gardeners, if you're just growing it for your, yourself, there aren't really rules as much. I mean, there's some things that of course are illegal, um, but you can do sort of the home remedies you find on the internet. They're not technically illegal. 
I can't really recommend them often because I don't want to be seen as recommending something that's not an EPA registered ingredient, um, things like that. Uh, but we can get into that later a little bit, I guess, if there's questions in the end. So looking back at our triangle, keep this in mind, um, the environment, the pathogens presence, and the susceptible host as how we think about some of our common diseases that we'll go through now in our last 15-ish minutes. Um, okay, here's a tomato leaf. This is one that is common on farms, not as common in gardens. And we'll talk about why. When you, so it looks yellow on the top. You flip it over and you see gray fuzzy sporulation. And this is called leaf mold. And it loves high humidity. And our gardens typically aren't as humid as it needs for uh, leaf mold to take a hold. But in a, a greenhouse or a high tunnel, um, it's hard to get as much airflow as we have, you know, just the regular wind and, and changing of air around it. And so these large greenhouse tomato plants can be taller than me easily, and they can be very leafy and they'll hold a lot of humidity. Uh, leaf mold can really take hold. The best control our growers have, uh, because it's not very susceptible to, to many of the fungicides that even commercial growers use, um, except for maybe a conventional commercial grower, but our organic commercial growers don't have many tools against it, except for resistant varieties. This is one of the cases, resi disease resistant varieties sometimes are more effective than others. With leaf mold, they're highly effective. You can grow a, a resistant, a leaf mold resistant tomato next to a not leaf mold resistant tomato in a, in a greenhouse. And this one will be totally fine. And this one will just be riddled with leaf mold and eventually die. Uh, this is much more common in our gardens, uh, at least the top picture. Uh, we have early blight up top. That is uh, one disease called alternaria. Septoria, I sometimes kind of just lump in with early blight because a disease and the causal organism, sometimes you have a couple organisms that cause the same disease because we're really talking about symptoms. Septoria looks a little different, but it can often be confused with early blight. Uh, and then late blight is sort of our big fear in the garden. And that's, that's one where, so some of the key distinctions here, early blight, it's everywhere. You can, you can prevent, you can delay it, but it's pretty much always gonna find tomatoes. So you're really, you're just trying to outgrow it. Um, and you might use copper fungicide to, to prevent it. Same thing with septoria, it's, it's not as everywhere as early blight is, but it, it will show up regularly. There is some resistance in your tomato varieties, but it's not 100%. You may just see that this variety gets it worse than that variety, and that variety is a little more tolerant of it. It's more of a tolerance than a true resistance. Um, late blight is a, it's actually not a fungus. It's a fungus-like organism. It's called a water mold. And they, it, this is the disease that caused the Irish potato famine. It goes through potatoes and tomatoes, and when the conditions are conducive to it, when it's wet uh, for a long period of time and the disease is present, it goes crazy. It doesn't overwinter here. So we haven't had an outbreak in Maine in a while, um, thankfully. And uh, we'll go back to late blight later. Uh, we'll get a little more into it. Right now, we'll start off with early blight, which is common, and you are probably going to see if you haven't already seen it in your tomatoes. So here's just another side by side to tell you the difference between early blight uh, has tends to have these sort of like bullseye like concentric rings. Um, and there's a leading edge of yellowing where this part of the leaf is already either infected or suffering from the disease uh, before it actually dies like the black spot in there. And that's kind of where you get these concentric rings. Septoria looks more like spotting. Uh, and both of these tend to, here's another one of early blight. This is very classic symptoms. Um, and, and most gardeners have seen this in their tomatoes, I feel like. If you haven't, good for you, you're lucky. Um, when it gets really bad, this is kind of where it, it takes off. And this is, this is a, a, yeah, that's a bad outbreak of early blight. Or it was not controlled at all. And it, it took over that tomato. And, 
basically you can probably still ripen those tomatoes, but they're not gonna taste as good as they would have off of a healthy plant. So it, they overwinter on crop debris. So those infected leaves, you know, by the time you pull that plant out of there, most of those leaves have kind of shattered and broken up into little parts and there's the disease still growing on it. So that's crop debris that's on the soil and they break into tiny little pieces. You can't, you cannot remove every single one out of your soil. They will be there. Uh, the way the initial infection often starts is in the spring, uh, heavy rain will splash bits of soil and bits of those leaves up onto your next year's plants. And that will be the initial infection. Early blight and septoria tend to kind of work their way up a plant. And so the initial infection happens on the lower leaves. And then once that the plant has lived there long enough that it's reproducing and making its own spores, they can, will get a little airborne, but they'll also splash up onto the next set of leaves, et cetera, et cetera. Um, if it's really wet, if there's leaf wetness, they can spread rapidly. If you've never had tomatoes in your garden before, you may still get it because once it's growing on your neighbor's tomatoes, those spores are releasing in the winds. And if the conditions are correct, they can blow into your garden and start to infect. So what do we do? We rotate away from where we grew our tomatoes before. Um, this is one where even in a backyard garden, just going from this garden bed to that garden bed over there, maybe one in between, you're gonna delay its onset. Um, optimum growing conditions. If it's a good year where it's not too wet, if it's not raining constantly, and it hasn't been the past couple of years, um, the plant will often outgrow it. You know, the, the lower leaves might get infected and maybe you remove those and the upper leaves might be just fine and you maybe didn't have to do anything else. Staking plants, having them tied up so that they're upright, they're gonna be, there's gonna be more wind around there so they're gonna dry off quicker. You're gonna have less of that leaf wetness. Um, also, they're gonna be away from the soil where that initial infection often occurs. Drip irrigation, that's one way to, to in the home garden, you may be just as if you're spring if you're watering by hand, water down at the roots. Don't just don't just hose over the entire plant. Um, but of course, there's so many different reasons we make all of our decisions. So of course, you can still use a sprinkler. Just try to think about how are you going to minimize the leaf wetness. And I guess I didn't put it into here anywhere else, but I did see a question about strategies for watering to minimize leaf wetness. The primary strategy is to do it in the early morning. Um, so say dew falls overnight, leaves are already wet, you water them again, they're still wet, but then they're drying off about the time during the day when they would have anyway, maybe a touch later because you made them wetter. Um, if you're watering later in the day, try to water, it, we often try not to water in the middle of the day because it's less efficient use of water, a lot of it evaporates, um, blows away, or just evaporates from the sun. But if you're watering later in the day, try to water early enough that the plant can dry off before nightfall when dew is again going to fall. You know, they're not going to, if the leaves are wet and the sun is set, it's going to stay wet for a while. And that's when disease can really take hold. And of course, we can't control the rain. So sometimes that's going to happen anyway. This is one reason we don't see early blight as an issue in greenhouses, because the leaves often don't have a wet a film of wetness on them. There may be high humidity, which that leaf mold would love, but early blight is not really an issue. And then mulching, if you have that crop residue in the soil and you know it's gonna be the initial inoculum, you plant your tomato and then you mulch around it, well, you reduce the splashing effect because water hits that and it doesn't have soil to splash up. And you may also be uh, sort of, depending on your, the thickness of your mulch materials, you may be capping in the spores that would be produced and would go airborne later. And then if you stake your tomatoes with wood stakes, it's always good practice to disinfect those, um, you know, like a bleach dip or uh, on a commercial scale, people use oxidate, which is like a hydrogen peroxide, but not likely to happen in a garden scale. Okay, here was the bad year. Yes. There was one question, someone asked if you can stop the spread of early blight or slow it, I guess, by removing the infected leaves. I wondered if yes. It, it helps to, that will help to slow the spread. Okay. I wouldn't say that it would stop it unless the weather conditions were really conducive, right? If 
if the lower leaves had become infected, you removed them and then it was a nice stretch of dry weather. And for some reason, there were not many spores around. Mm. Uh, you know, if you, it's a good idea to handle diseased tissue on a hot, sunny, uh, a sunny dry day. It doesn't have to be hot, but sunny and dry so that things dry out. The UV kills uh, spores, things like that. So back to late blight. This is it, people often confuse early blight and late blight. Um, they're totally different diseases. Um, and 2009 was the bad year. And that was one where a company, a big box store that sells transplants to home growers, you know, like uh, one of those big hardware stores, uh, was buying in seedlings from down south. And the greenhouse that they were buying them from, the company, you know, one of these giant greenhouses, many acres in size they had late blight in their plants and they either didn't realize it or they were being irresponsible and they shipped them all the way up the east coast and late blight spread from the spring so late blight was early that year instead of being something that maybe comes up with storms over time uh, and it can just devastate a crop it can take all of your tomatoes and all of your potatoes and turn them to kind of like mush in short order if the weather conditions are appropriate. Here's one of the, the indicators is that it has uh, white sporulation that really helps show off, sh helps us diagnose that, oh, that's late, like that's not something else. Um, and here it is infecting tomatoes themselves. Um, of course, Maine being a big potato state, it's a big deal. We don't want late blight here. Uh, and the only way, the reason it doesn't overwinter here normally is that it needs a living host. It doesn't, the late blight that we have here commonly does not have an overwintering stage. It is theoretically possible, but we've never had the overwintering stage here in Maine uh, that we know of. Um, so it needs a living host. So the only way it would commonly overwinter here in Maine is through infected tubers because that, that potato is alive and it will re-sprout. And so if you had potatoes that were infected and you threw them into the compost and then they didn't die in the compost because most home garden composts aren't like hot enough to, to really kill things the way a commercial compost is, um, you could potentially spread late blight all around. So if, you, if we get a late blight year, let's just tuck this in the back of your mind because you know, it doesn't look like we're getting it uh, this year, but it's still early days, so who knows. Um, but if, uh, if late blight becomes an issue, just be very conscious of what happens with your potatoes because they might be infected and you don't want to be the person that starts the spread of it the next year and is the reason why it overwintered here when it doesn't normally. So for commercial producers, they have to manage their tubers. We, like in potato fields, they can actually, the, the ones that get missed during harvest um, can survive in overwinter. And if they're infected, that could be a source. Uh, there is a late blight map. Here is the map from 2018. It got kind of close, New York State, but the rest of New England, all of New England did not get late blight. We didn't get it 2019 and we didn't get it 2020. Not, not in any real sense anyway. Here's our current map. Um, yeah, there's no report in the country of late blight anywhere, which is great. This, I guess, is when I should plug the pest report if you don't already get it. Um, I have a weekly call with extension folks uh, around New England, and we talk about, you know, have there been reports of late blight yet? Um, have there been reports of this pest or that disease? And uh, that helps us track its spread. And we in Maine, being so far east and so far north, are actually really lucky. We're at the really lucky end because we can see it happen in Massachusetts or Connecticut. And then we get that warning and we know that that's, that's that, that part of the triangle is the pathogen or the pest present. Then you have to worry about control. Um, so late blight, absolutely no reason to be spraying fungicide on your tomatoes because you're worried about late blight because it's nowhere near us. It's not coming. Uh, and that's not to say it can't come, but as of now, it's not coming. So if you want that warning of it's getting close, sign up for the pest report. Uh, speaking of these maps, there's another one for down, basil downy mildew, and that's one that did surprise us. It is already here. And it actually, that same story about that, that 
a large greenhouse company that sells plants to these big box stores. Um, they are suspected of doing the same thing with basil downy mildew, growing basil that is already infected with downy mildew and these big box stores were selling them, had come up from the south. So now it's been found in New Jersey, Long Island, and even Maine. Um, so uh, basal downy mildew is a nice example of one of those diseases that can show up. Uh, it's, there's more information in the pest report we have about it um, on our website. But uh, the, the big take home here is that this is one where a resistant variety really works. So basal, basal downy mildew is still relatively new to the US. It wasn't a problem until, I don't remember, not too long ago, less than 20 years ago. And uh, as soon as it got here, there were breeding programs racing to find how to breed a, a resistant variety. And they have succeeded in the past few years. And so we now have varieties that may not be 100% resistant. They may eventually succumb to the disease, but for all intents and purposes, for us here in Maine, they're about as resistant as we need and you can get a normal basil crop. Um, then uh, powdery mildew. Here's another one that's very common in our gardens. Here's a picture in my, my bee balm has powdery mildew. I'm a little disappointed. Uh, here's a picture from years ago in squash and um, that's also powdery mildew, but those are my dog. Okay, um, so those are different pathogens. They are very closely related. They're both a type of powdery mildew, but um, the one that infects the bee bomb will not infect squash. The one that infects squash will not infect lilacs. You know, it's another one that commonly gets a powdery mildew. Um, there are many types of powdery mildew and they're, they tend to be fairly species specific. This type of powdery mildew only infects this one or two species. This one only infects this one or two species. So cucurbit powdery mildew, squash, cucumbers, melons, um, this one in the bee bomb, I, it probably has some alternate hosts. I don't remember them being an issue uh, or being common. I don't remember. Uh, I just know that I have it in my bee bomb. It's probably going to keep happening to me unless I yank this plant out and plant a resistant variety. And I think there may be some powdery mildew resistant varieties of bee bomb. Uh, in squash, there are some varieties, some types of squash have been bred to be powdery mildew resistant. They haven't gotten those same resistance genes into every type of squash. So, you know, you might find a butternut that is powdery mildew resistant, but that doesn't mean that you'll find a buttercup or an acorn. And that's just an example. I'm not actually, I don't know all the varieties that well, but often those varieties say, you know, the name of the variety and then at the back they say PMR and it should tell you in the description, but PMR usually would stand for powdery mildew resistant. And this is one where it's often not a, true 100% resistance, but it's a, a, at least an intermediate or moderate resistance. Um, and with squash in New England, it's sort of inevitable. We almost always get powdery mildew and it usually kills the leaves, but we still usually get squash crops out of it. And really just a little bit of resistance is all you need for your plant to live long enough and keep those leaves green long enough for you to get a good harvest out of it. Uh, this picture is also one that I liked because here's a zucchini on the right and you can see it's really succumbing to powdery mildew. This is butternut squash on the left and uh, they're different species, but they're closely related. They're both types of squash mm -hmm. and the butternut squash is showing much greater resistance. Um, it's not really being affected by the powdery mildew at all, even though it is that powdery mildew can infect it. It just is going to it needs a lot higher disease pressure and perfect conditions in order to finally get through all the defenses that that resistant variety has. Um, and then, oh, another picture I took this morning in my garden. I get this a lot, uh, a lot of new growers. Um, this is a normal zucchini leaf. There are some pumpkins that do this as well, but it can really, when you're, when you're on the lookout for powdery mildew, it can, and you're a new grower, it often throws people off. Um, 
that's healthy. That's normal. That's not powdery mildew. Um, and I think we're, yeah, we're, we're running out of time, but I'm almost done. Spinach downy mildew is another one that's not super common, but it is becoming more and more of an issue. And we have some information in the pest report. I've written about it in the, the Mafka newspaper, if you want to dig up that older article. And I think my last slide is just how to reach me. Um, Instagram, if you're interested, and our pest report link is all there. Okay, I'm gonna drink uh, some more seltzer, wet my whistle. Um, so I have a list of questions, um, not a huge one, but how about we start back at the beginning? Um, a couple of them I think were, were more or less answered, but I, I'm gonna ask this one again, just in case it yeah. wasn't fully answered. Um, does mul mulching the, the soil stop the, um, I think this is part of the conversation about early blight. Um, mm -hmm. Does that, can that really help to eliminate your chances of getting early blight or, I think you did sort of talk to that, Caleb. Is there anything yeah, else it, you want to add? It, it won't eliminate it, but it will often delay it. And that's usually all we really need is because when you get early blight taking off and, and becoming bad early on in the season, that's when it becomes a problem. Um, and if people were observant when they noticed the pictures of my tomatoes, I haven't mulched mine yet. And so that's uh, do as I say, not as I have done so far. Um, <laughs> I, I just haven't gotten around to it. Um, and this year it hasn't been an issue because it's been very dry. But my house, I've been fortunate to be getting a lot of these past rains these past few days. So I'm thinking, uh oh, it might be starting to infect my lower leaves and it just hasn't shown up yet. And I need to get on that. Otherwise, I'm going to be chasing it. Uh, I'd rather be a little bit ahead of it. Mm -hmm. And it like can still blow in on the winds from neighbors and other people who have early blight. Mm. And someone just um, asked, what do you yet like to use as mulch? Oh, uh, my the preferred, and it actually has been tested and shown to be a little bit better than like leaf mulch. Leaf mulch is fine. Uh, pretty much anything to to block that soil from splashing up um, and hopefully if it's thick enough to to kind of hold the spores down below trap them. But you also want some air exchange um, and and sort of the the traditional standard is rye straw and for some reason rye straw actually tends has been proven to reduce the incidence of early blight um, versus some other mulches and I think it may just be particularly inhospitable. It's also white and it's maybe reflecting some light up to the tomatoes and they're maybe getting a little extra light that way, a little better growth. Wow, interesting. Cool. Um, one person said they heard that diluted aspirin could be used as a foliar spray to protect against blight. Have you heard that? Um, I think I've heard it. I don't think I've seen it tested. Um, so I wouldn't be able to say whether that's like 100% true or not. The rationale behind it is probably that aspirin is sort of um, a de derived from salicylic acid. And there is a plant defense pathway that is the salicylic acid pathway. And so I think the idea would be that you would be sort of inducing that the plant's um, natural response. I would say I'd rather go for a product like Regalia, which is labeled and it, it's actually made from Japanese knotweed and it induces the plant's natural um, defenses. And that's been tested, it's been tested and proven to do that. I don't know that aspirin's gonna be a harm. Um, our commercial growers would not be allowed to do that um, because they would be using it as if it were a fungicide and it's not a labeled fungicide and therefore that would be an illegal use. A home gardener can probably do that if you wanted to try it out. I would say leave one untreated and see if it makes a difference or not. I would suspect it probably doesn't make a difference. Mm -hmm. uh, but I also don't think it's probably going to hurt. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, someone else asking about neem products. Is there any particular neem product that you'd recommend and are all of them uh, organic? 
Uh, so it's sort of a two-part question. One is that I don't actually use neem that much myself, and so I don't, there's a couple different ways you can get it. The, the active ingredient is as a directin, and there are some products you get that are like uh, refined as a directin that's been taken, removed from neem, and that's going to be very useful in terms of um, pest issues. Uh, there are other ones where they're more, less refined and it's like neem oil or it might be cold pressed neem oil and the azadiractin may actually have already been removed um, but there's some good that's still going to be there and other folks can know better than i do how well those work i tend to not rely on it uh, but to know whether what you're buying is organic or not um, or allowed for use in organic production not every product that is allowed for use gets OMRI listed, O-M-R-I, but most of them do. So, and anything that is OMRI listed is allowed for use in organic production. So that stands for the Organic Materials Review Institute. They review materials for whether they're allowed to be used in organic systems or not. Um, and so they will often be included on a label and just O-M-R-I, OMRI. Uh, and that's the easiest way to, to know. Great. Um, a question from Steve that I'm just going to read. Um, Every year in the fall, I have a small fire in the garden and burn all the final spent plant material like squash, cucumbers, peppers, tomatoes, potatoes, etc. I add some dry hardwood to get a good hot fire and then I till the ashes into the soil. I even add the summer's larger plants from the compost piles as I assume the bugs and diseases live there. What do you think about this practice? Um, I, there's some logic. I would say it's sort of, you're sort of doing it as an insurance policy, it sounds like, because there are times when I would strongly recommend that. Um, and there are times when I don't think it's probably not necessary, but you also maybe don't know, right? So uh, when people like for pests, because pests and diseases, we can kind of talk about them similarly. When folks are struggling with a lot of squash bugs um, and they will overwinter in the crop debris. If you don't have an active compost pile that's heating up, and most home gardeners don't just because they're not large enough to really retain the heat and, and get up to, to uh, get up to temperature to kill things, um, you might want to destroy that crop debris and, and prevent the, the bug from overwintering. Uh, and that would just help reduce the population the next year. Uh, if it were something like late blight, Again, as long as the plant is dead, it can no longer spread. The, the pathogen needs a living plant to live off of, and that's the only way it spreads, at least here in New England. Um, so it's going to vary a little bit situation by situation. If you had a very active compost pile and you're a really good composter, you had a compost thermometer and you knew you were turning it and getting the outsides mixed into the inside, so the outside will heat up as well and you're getting it up to 140 degrees or so, um, then you know you're probably killing most of what's in there. Um, so it's just gonna vary a bit on, on what it is. Uh, but I can also see the logic too. I don't know what's in there. I know my compost pile isn't that good, and at least I know I'm, I'm uh, destroying what's potential. The downside to that is you're losing the organic matter. Um, which would hopefully be helping to give you good, healthy soil. So it's a bit of a trade-off in that sense. Mm -hmm. um, it's, so I would say not the worst thing, as long as you're doing it safely and you know, getting a fire burn permit, et cetera. Um, but uh, it is, you know, my ideal world, we'd all have big, beautiful compost piles that heat it up nicely. Of course, that doesn't, it's not easier said than done. Mm. Yeah. All right, um, another question that I'm just gonna read from Douglas. He says, um, Caleb, do you use a scheduled spraying of perhaps neem oil or peppermint oil sprays or hydrogen peroxide, baking soda diluted with water um, as preventative measures? Do you like to use so any of those things? I actually don't do it in my own garden. <laughs> when I get powdery mildew, I just get powdery mildew. Uh, and I kind of go with it, but I'm not reliant on my garden to feed me. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm hoping to feed myself as much as I can from the garden, 
Uh, and it's also not my livelihood. For my the commercial growers I work with, they are going to be doing that. But it's going to depend a little bit on what disease they're worried about, uh, whether it's present or not, uh, the weather conditions. So when we're getting later in the summer, when our nights are longer and we tend to have dew hanging around for a longer time, and so you're more likely to have that water film or just high humidity, powdery mildew really takes off. And if you're growing acres of winter squash, you don't want to lose all your leaves to powdery mildew. That's one, that's probably the one in my garden that I'm closest to, I might start doing like a baking soda spray because I, again, home scale, not commercial. I can just use baking soda. A commercial grower needs to use potassium bicarbonate, which is almost the same thing as baking soda, but it has an EPA label on it and it has specific instructions. Um, and that's one that I would probably start to think to do. Um, I wouldn't worry just yet. It won't, I'm not worried about powdery mildew showing up. I might wait until I saw the first leaves getting infected. I would probably remove those older leaves, it tends to be the older leaves that are infected, and then I might consider spraying uh, my other, the rest of my squash to, to reduce the chance of the powdery mildew taking hold. And I didn't mention before, the way that works is the bicarbonate part of baking soda, which is sodium bicarbonate, and then a commercial grower uses potassium bicarbonate. So it doesn't really matter. It's the, the bicarbonate part is changing the pH of the leaf surface. And so that powdery mildew spore runs into a, a, an environment that's hostile to it. It's too high of a pH for it to take off. Um, somebody just typed in what what is the formula for making a baking soda spray? Do you know how much you would put in? Uh, I don't actually know off the top of my head, uh, yeah. but there are lots of re there's lots of recipes online of how do you make a baking soda spray for powdery mildew. I think a lot of people like to use a little bit of soap to help it spread out across the leaf. Um, you would want to try to get it on the underside of leaves, but really as long as it's uh, you, you would want a, a fair amount of baking soda, but you want it to be liquid enough that you can actually get it through a sprayer and applied. Mm, yeah, awesome. Um, we are two minutes over time, but we have a couple more questions. Um, do you think we could take five more minutes, Caleb? Yeah. Okay, um, or we'll, we'll see how long these guys take. So I'm gonna ask, yeah. Uh, one about um, yellowing in zucchini. What might modeled yellowing in zucchini and winter squash leaves be? They did get quite neglected with late transplanting, and there was a little hail and irregular watering. Um, any ideas? Well, it's going to be hard to say without um, pictures, but it could be a lot of things. I mean, hail is going to cause leaf damage and some dead spots anyway. Um, and uh, there are also some viruses that can cause it, modeling. Um, there are, and we didn't talk about viruses today. That's one of those, that's, that's a, almost its own subject. Uh, and it's still fairly rare, thankfully, for us to see viruses. Um, but they can cause modeling. Um, and there are also some other diseases that Foliar diseases in squash, other than powdery mildew, you kind of like, there's only so much you can do. You can remove the disease tissue. Uh, you, you might have to, you want to, they, it often either comes in from seed. So you want to consider your seed source, make sure it's reputable. And um, the other thing is that they can also overwinter on crop residue. So you want to at least compost it. Or again, as the other uh, questioner asked about burning, you could consider that. Um, but oftentimes the plants just outgrow it. And so the older leaves that are infected, you can remove them, they'll die back. And then the new leaves are often healthy. So the first thing I would do is just keep an eye on the new growth. And if you see issues showing up in the new growth as well, then shoot me an email uh, or reach out to your local extension office and uh, get connected to the University of Maine Plant Disease Diagnostic Lab and they can help you uh, diagnose uh, plant diseases. Great, okay, we're down to our last two questions. Um, the first one, Robert asks, would a biological barrier work on the soil below the plants as a preventative measure during prolonged wet periods, or would these um, nearly rinse into the soil? 
neem would be an example, or then he said perhaps a sulfur or copper application. So it sounds like this would be targeting a soil disease. Um, there are some biological products where they're bacteria, um, where they are beneficial bacteria that have been shown to fight um, fungal diseases. And those are sometimes applied as a soil drench or sometimes uh, mixed into potting mix. And then uh, you would plant that in and that would help. I don't think neem is typically used in that way, although there may be someone who's using it that way and I just don't know about it. Um, sulfur or copper is typically used to modify the leaf surface. So I would not, it's not going to do much for you in the soil. Um, so you would, it's usually a foliar spray. Um, I would think that the only thing in that vein of, of thought would be a, a beneficial bacterial product. Um, and there's many different brands and that's, this is an area where we need so much more research to talk about like, when is it actually effective? Is it effective at all? How do we give it its best a chance of being effective? And uh, prolonged wet periods, it depends on if they I mean, you know, like it's been raining every couple of days versus the soil is a little flooded. And in that instance, there's not much you can do and the plant's gonna be struggling because it won't have as much oxygen at the roots anyway. Hmm. Okay, um, last question, and it, it relates a little more to pests than diseases, but um, we'll sneak it in here. Um, Hannah is asking about straw as mulch, um, particularly under squash plants. She's heard that that encourages squash bugs. And so she asked if wood chips, pine wood chips would be an alternative, or maybe you have another suggestion. Um, so any mulch under squash plants is going to, uh, I wouldn't say encourage squash bugs so much as it's going to give them good habitat to hide in, as well as to potentially overwinter in and become an issue and pop up again next spring and then seek out your squash plants wherever you planted them. Uh, uh, so it would, straw makes a great mulch in general, but, and wood chips can make a nice mulch. You don't want to till them back into the soil because once they get mixed into the soil, the bacteria will try to break them down and they will pull nitrogen out of the soil. Uh, any available nitrogen, they will latch onto it and use it to digest the wood. And that will lock up the nitrogen and not make it accessible to your plants. If you leave the, if you're a no-till garden and you just leave the wood chips on the surface, that's fine because it's only that bacteria is only interacting at the soil mulch interface. Um, but you know, next year if you did a, a pine bark or whatever, a, a woody, a really woody mulch, and you incorporate that into the soil, it's going to take a long time for it to break down, and it's going to lock up nitrogen for a while until it does start breaking down. You know, a couple of years later, then it'll release it again. Um, but anyway, the, the question was about squash bug and it's really more the habitat and that it doesn't matter what your mulch is. It could be black plastic mulch like um, large growers might use or landscape fabric. The squash bugs will go right under there and they'll hide. Um, some folks use that to their advantage when they're growing in a non-mulched garden. You know, you, have, you see that you have a lot of squash bugs. So you take an old leaf that you're removing anyway, you cut it off throw it in the, the pathway by your plants. And then the next morning you lift it up and look under it. And that's where you find the squash bugs because they're hiding under there. Um, uh, but yeah, anytime you have a thick mulch, it, the squash bugs can really just hide from you, hide from other predators. And they will, it'll also shelter them over winter. It'll be somewhere where they can kind of nestle in. Mm. Thanks so much, Caleb. That was so jam-packed with great information and lots of thanks coming in to the chat.